The surrealist Salvador Dali once wrote, Mistakes are almost always of a sacred nature. Never try to correct them. Before presumably drawing a clock all wrong. What's the matter, this guy never seen a clock before or something? But even a broken clock painter is right twice a day. Mistakes are a natural part of any artistic endeavour. And nowhere is this more true than in comic books, where the rapid rate of production demands a greater margin for error. With some comic book artists, writers and editors overseeing multiple titles per month, it's understandable that a few goose and gaffes will make their way onto the printed page. Whether that be typos, oh sorry that should be typos, continuity errors, or art accidents that completely change a story's intended meaning. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and this is what happens when comic book creators make mistakes. We know him as Peter Palmer, but the world knows him only as Spider-Man. Wait, hang on, that's not right, is it? In 1962, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko took the superhero world by storm with the introduction of Spider-Man. Now, we all know the story of Peter Parker, the unassuming teenager who is bitten by a radioactive spider and then gains awesome arachnid abilities. But that's Peter Parker, not Peter Palmer, as Stan Lee writes not once, but twice in the character's second appearance in Amazing Spider-Man issue one. Minutes later, Peter Palmer reaches the roof of an adjoining building. Now look, to be fair to Stan, he was scripting so many comics for Marvel in the 1960s and co-creating so many new characters that you can't really blame him for getting a few names mixed up. Like, for example, referring to Hulk love interest Betty Ross as Daily Bugle secretary Betty Brandt, twice in two consecutive issues. Or Rick Jones confusing the Hulk's secret identity, Dr. Bruce Banner, with that of Thor, Dr. Donald Blake, in Avengers issue two. But for a character as now iconic and famous as Peter Parker, it's pretty funny to look back and see that even his co-creator couldn't remember his name. Stan the Man wasn't the only Marvel writer to make this kind of gaffe though, as Lee's protege and eventual successor as editor-in-chief, Roy Thomas, once wrote in Savage Sword of Conan issue 25, Is it indeed Yalea up there, as he fears? Or that little hussy, Muriella, turned waitress after all? Now, it's safe to assume that Thomas meant to say traitress there, but still, given the sword and sorcery setting, the idea of Conan the Barbarian feuding with a waitress is objectively hilarious. Speaking of feuds, if there's anything I've learned from professional wrestling, it's that the best fighters fight with their words. Of course, Spider-Man is famous for his quips and one-liners, and as the merc with the mouth, Deadpool's dialogue is as deadly as his dual desert eagles. Alliteration. But one Marvel hero who could stand to level up his trash talk is Captain America, who in 1967's Tales of Suspense issue 92 tells one foe, only one of us is gonna walk out of here under his own steam, and it won't be me. Come on, Cap, have a bit of confidence in yourself, man. <laughs> Evidently, that line was supposed to end, and it won't be you. So either Steve Rogers was being uncharacteristically defeatist, or Stan Lee should have hired a proofreader. Enough said. So when it comes to talking smack, the star-spangled man with a plan could learn a thing or two from Frank Miller's potty mouth version of Batgirl in All-Star Batman and Robin. This series is infamous for its edgy, try-hard dialogue. Even if you haven't read it yourself, I'm sure you've seen the panels where Batman calls his boy wonder companion the R word, and I'm not talking about Robin, <laughs> or the often memed line, I'm the goddamn Batman. And it was much in that same spirit that Frank Miller decided to characterize Barbara Gordon, AKA Batgirl, as a rebellious teenager who swears like a fucking sailor. No problem, DC editorial thought, we'll just black out the profanity with center bars. Except due to a misprint in All-Star Batman and Robin The Boy Wonder issue 10, Batgirl's colourful language was still visible beneath the black bars. Deciding that the world wasn't quite ready for an R-rated Batman comic in 2008, DC recalled thousands of copies of the offending issue, turning it into an overnight collectible, and even landing the story on the mainstream news. But this isn't the only time that DC has had to recall a comic due to unforeseen obscenity, as in 2012's Swamp Thing issue 11, an unfortunately placed pink tentacle made it look as though Abigail Arcane had more than one reason to recoil in horror from her villainous uncle Anton. Uncle Anton, stop. Writer Scott Snyder took to Twitter to accept full responsibility for the fallacious phallus, explaining that he had been the one to request more tentacles in the offending panel. Talk about a Freudian slip. <laughs> I'm afraid I might slip and fall on that thing. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately if you're into that sort of thing, DC Editorial caught the erroneous erection early enough to have all copies pulped before they ever hit store shelves. And a reprint was issued, now with 100% less monster penis. You know, the truth is that sometimes a mistake like this can actually improve a comic, or at least make it a lot funnier, as was the case back in August 1981 
when an edition of the Dayton Daily News accidentally swapped the captions of The Far Side and Dennis the Menace, with surreal but hilarious results. Now these two cartoons ran side by side in the paper, but tonally they are very different. Gary Larson's The Far Side, which ran from 1979 to 1995, is known for its offbeat existential humour, often mixing anthropomorphism with dark comedy to take a good hard look at the human condition. Dennis the Menace, meanwhile, well, <laughs> it isn't anything like that. It's all about Dennis Mitchell, the mischievous but ultimately harmless little tyke getting into scrapes and japes and just being a complete a-hole to his neighbour. So when in 1981 the Dayton Daily News mixed up the captions of these two cartoons, it made it look as though the far side had lost its edge, with a group of snakes sat around a table eating peanut butter sandwiches. But even more bizarrely, that Dennis the Menace had taken to eating hamsters. Worse still, another switch up happened just a few years later, leaving Dennis the Menace eerily looking towards his parents and saying, I see your little petrified skull labelled and resting on a shelf somewhere. Staying in the world of newspaper comics, we can't not talk about everybody's favourite lasagna munching, Monday loathing, orange tabby cat, Garfield. With over 15,000 published comic strips since the character debuted in 1978, you can't really blame Garfield creator Jim Davis for making a few blunders. But in 2010, Davis found himself in hot water when a Garfield strip was published on Veterans Day, which appeared to mark the federal holiday. In the strip, Garfield holds a rolled up newspaper above a spider, who warns, if you squish me, I will become famous. They will hold an annual day of remembrance in my honor. And then smash cut to the final panel of a spider teacher asking its class, does anyone here know why we celebrate National Stupid Day? Yeah, so obviously, yikes. Uh, but as Jim Davis explained in an apology, it was just an unfortunate coincidence that this was published on Veterans Day and not some kind of political statement. Worst timing ever, Davis wrote. It absolutely, positively had nothing to do with this important day of remembrance. For me though, when I think of unfortunate Garfield comics, my mind goes straight to this 1990 strip in which it appears that the punchline is John Arbuckle, Garfield's hapless owner, inadvertently drinking a cup of dog semen. <laughs> well, that was certainly how the comic was interpreted as it spread across online message boards, with the dialogue reading, Congratulations, Mr. Arbuckle, you are going to give birth to a fine, healthy litter of puppies. So several years of Reddit posts and tweets later, this comic had received so much attention that in 2017, Buzzfeed reached out to Jim Davis for clarification. On the farm, we used to give first calf heifers a high protein supplement to help them deliver healthier calves, Davis explained. I assumed that there would be a similar supplement for dogs. So John is drinking a protein enriched drink formulated for a pregnant dog. So you can call that particular comic book mistake despunked. I, I mean debunked. All right, all right, if this video is gonna devolve into toilet humor, perhaps we should pay a visit to Batgirl's bathroom, an apparent art mistake that achieved a similar level of internet virality just a few years ago. Appearing in 2016's Batgirl and the Birds of Prey issue five, this panel drew derision for apparently depicting a poorly designed bathroom in which the door is blocked by the bath and a rug is set underneath the bath and toilet. The image was widely shared on Twitter and Reddit, leading to passionate debates about the state of modern comic book art, or the image's deeper meaning as a depiction of the poor living conditions in Gotham City. And look, as someone who has lived in an inner city apartment with a particularly shitty bathroom, an inaccessible mystery door wouldn't be that much of a surprise to me, to be honest. But let's be kind to artist Roge Antonio here and assume that this isn't supposed to be a door or a rug for that matter, but instead a funky wall and floor tile design and some unfortunate cropping. But that leads me to the real question. What's up with the toilet plunger just sitting out there on the floor like that? Ugh. But back to Marvel, and even the esteemed king of comics, Jack Kirby, wasn't immune to error. Kirby was famous for his unparalleled use of foreshortening, with his character's hands often reaching out towards the reader. Nobody drew hands like Jack Kirby, like five great sausages stuffed into a glove. But on the opening page of Fantastic Four issue 88, cover dated July 1969, Kirby inadvertently gives Reed Richards two left hands. And that's nothing, because in Fantastic Four issue 152, artist Rich Buckler gives Reed a hand for a foot. Now, given Mr. Fantastic's stretchy superpowers, I suppose both of these mistakes are technically, canonically possible, but they still left readers scratching their heads at the time. And while we're taking a hands-on approach, it would be remiss of me not to mention this timeless continuity error from Avengers issue 160, cover dated June 1977, in which the antagonist, Grim Reaper, known for the prosthetic scythe in place of his right hand, is briefly shown pulling his mask on with two intact hands. That is quite the party trick. Come on, everybody, give the man a round of applause. 
I spy with my little eye the one-eyed Captain Barracuda using a periscope wrong in The Incredible Hulk issue 219. Or this periscope be faulty, get me another. Aye aye, Captain. Oh, sorry, poor choice of words. Okay, cheesy jokes aside, we started this video with Stan Lee getting Peter Parker's name wrong, so it's only right that we end with him mixing up Marvel's most popular hero with that of the distinguished competition. Yes, you're reading that right, during Doc Ock's villainous monologuing in Amazing Spider-Man issue 3, cover dated July 1963, Lee mistakenly refers to Spider-Man as Superman, and somehow DC didn't take legal action. It's, it's amazing. All I can say is... Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Now, some would argue that the biggest mistake in comics was how batshit crazy the costumes got in the 1990s. The spikes, the mullets, the chains, the boob windows. To see me talk all about the worst superhero costumes of the 1990s, click the video on screen now and I will see you over there.